Welcome to the Miguel Cairo era edition of Sharing Socks. I'm Southside Sox duty geezer Lee Allen, and with me, my son and West Coast correspondent Will, who is enjoying 107 degree weather in Los Angeles. We're recording on Friday after uh, taking two out of three, which from Kansas City, and still somehow losing the season series in Kansas City. But before, big weekend series uh, with Minnesota starting on Friday night. First, though, we must get to the elephant in the room. As always, everything about the White Sox is about the Hall of Famer baseball person. Well, I'm not on Twitter, uh, so I'm curious, what is the Twitter reaction? What, what, do you, what are you seeing amongst the folks who follow the Sox on that? Yeah, I mean, um, there's, of course, the first school of thought, which is hope it's not serious, hope he's okay, hope he's not so okay that he comes back to manage, but I hope he's actually all right, and this isn't a Well, sure, a, yes, a, we're, not, a we're, not, we're not wishing ill, we just wish gone, basically. Yeah, yeah, I mean, we wish what you would wish for an ill 77-year-old guy, which is stay home and get better. Um, but a lot of suspicion going around, uh, which is the camp I am in, you know, he was, he was there up until about an hour before the game a few days ago, uh, the, the first game against Kansas city. Then all of a sudden his doctors call and say, you shouldn't be managing starting tonight. Um, which is a strange thing considering, you know, he usually at least gets a good nap in during a game. So uh, I I don't view him as a high intensity manager in any way, shape or form anymore. Uh, He is not, you know, he's not an NFL coach out there screaming at guys. He's pretty much just standing around quietly. So I don't know what the doctors would have seen that said, Hey man, you got to get out of there. Uh, but apparently they saw something. Uh, but my theory, which I do share with a lot of White Sox Twitter, is that this is the saving face way of having La Russa not be the manager next year. Uh, I, I don't know if we'll see him again this year. Maybe, maybe like towards the very end after they announce that he's not going to come back next year. Uh, but I, I don't in any way, shape, or form think that this is a thing where he had his doctors call and say, you can't manage, it's this real serious thing. Uh, I, I really do think that we are in a, a scenario where this is Reinsdorf finding a way to save face uh, so that Tony can leave on his own terms at the end of this season. That's That's my thought. Interesting things to me, and of course, the, one of the problems is nobody believes anything that the White Sox front office of Jerry Reinsdorf says, not that Reinsdorf says anything to anybody but Bob Nightingale. They have no credibility. And apparently, I was listening to the score this morning on my way to do grocery shopping, and apparently, I mean, the guys on the score were really ticked that Rick Hahn would not talk. He, he wouldn't meet with the press at all. And then there was some sort of line like, well, if, if I talk to them about that. There'll be questions about other things. Well, that's your job. (laughs) Yeah. If there are questions about other things, you should answer them. Apparently, they sent Miguel Cairo out to take all the heat on anything. It's just, this is an insufferable organization. Uh, Totally agree. Yeah. I mean, it's insane that Rick Hahn will not answer questions. You're the general manager of a professional baseball team that is in total disarray and now your manager's gone you're not going to answer questions but anyway go ahead the the now there are limitations on what very strong limitations on what the white Sox could say because of medical privacy rules unless larusa says yeah it's okay they really can't say much of anything except there's a problem but it is very strange to me he's in chicago or was in chicago now, obviously, it wasn't a heart attack or something, or ambulances would have been coming with sirens screaming. So it was something that could be handled. Chicago has some of the best hospitals 
and doctors in the world. Why do you leave Chicago? Then there were these bizarre things, and I will put this on people like Nightingale, who probably screwed everything up. So then he flies to Arizona, presumably to see his own cardiologist, which is kind of interesting. He's even got a cardiologist. Um, I'm two years younger. I've never even seen a cardiologist, let alone have one on call. Uh, you also but, don't have a, a lifetime of binge drinking. I yeah. mean, it, that, I get why he would have his own cardiologist. I don't understand why that cardiologist calls him an hour before the game and says, hey, man, you can't manage tonight. Um, but, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. But, but then the thing is, great. so he flies to Arizona because that's his own doctor. Okay, okay you trust your own doctor. That, that's fine. But then the next thing, and I think it was Nightingale who screws everything up, saying that he was then going to the Mayo Clinic. The Mayo Clinic is not in Arizona. It's in Rochester, Minnesota. That is not close to Arizona. Arizona is not on the way to Rochester, Minnesota. So if you were going to the Mayo Clinic anyway, which is fine, excellent source, excellent, absolutely excellent place to go. Why would you go by way of Arizona? You're, then they were saying, Wednesday, Wednesday he was flying to Arizona, and Thursday he would be at the Mayo Clinic. That's a lot of flying, which is about as tense these days as anything you can do. Uh, on will I make my flight? I don't know if they put him in a private plane uh, to make these trips or not. I can guarantee he's on a charter flight. Yeah, there's, you know, I mean, come on, yeah. But even at that, you know, that gets rid of a lot of the annoyance, but. Even at that, it's very strange to go by way of Arizona. His, his doctor could see that whatever test results, because apparently it wasn't his doctor who made this decision on Tuesday, but it was a cardiologist in Chicago. His doctor could see all the results, all the readouts, and got marvelous communication these days electronically, and could say, yeah, you better, yeah, there's this guy at the Mayo Clinic who's the expert on this particular, whatever it is. It's... It's just a very, very odd situation. Well, okay. So if it was a Chicago cardiologist who made this call, if that's a White Sox fan, then yeah. Okay. <laughs> Maybe he was making it up. So then you go to Arizona and he lands in Arizona and he goes into his cardiologist and the cardiologist goes, how about that sweep, huh? Go D-backs. <laughs> and then Tony says, oh God, I got to go to a place where I'm welcome, Minnesota, because I know <laughs> Twins fans want me to live. They want me to stick this out because as long and as I'm coaching year. the White Sox, <laughs> the Twins are in okay shape. So he goes to Minnesota. So that all that all tracks baseball fandom wise. Uh, in terms of the medical aspect, no clue. None of this makes any sense. I don't believe anything the White Sox are telling me ever. So especially in this, and, and you're right, like there are things the White Sox can't tell you because of, you know, doctor patient confidentiality and stuff like that. But you do need to address the fact that a different person's managing your baseball team now. And I get that they send Miguel Cairo out for, for the postgame, but someone from higher up should be addressing the fact that the bench coach is now the manager of the White Sox. And that's not a weird thing to have happen. That's not a, it's it not a, all the time. It happens all the time. So now, and, and, and the fact that you would announce that he's out indefinitely and still not talk about how the bench coach is now the manager indefinitely. If this was just that one game, then sure, you don't have a press conference to talk about you know, if Tony had the flu and Miguel Cairo's in, and you just say that. But, you know, we're not looking at who knows how long having our bench coach as the manager, which I, I'm not frowning on that. I love Miguel Cairo, but this is a big deal. This is a big deal to say our manager is out for an indeterminate amount of time. That's huge. So the fact that the team is silent really, in all reality, silent about what is going on here when we have a an under, under, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Under, under, 
underplaying, under underperforming, performing, <laughs> underperforming. There it is. You're a performer. You should know you're the uh, word. I should, I should. I should know that. Uh, underperforming team, uh, and we have a new manager. All of a sudden, we're still technically in this thing because the other teams in the division are so terrible. Yet we aren't talking about what the plan is necessarily moving forward. Uh, this is absurd. I, I mean, it's it's uh, I I don't like to think in conspiracies, especially with something as silly as baseball. But like, what is going on here? What what is happening? This this organization is just a total crap show. I, I don't get it. Well, I'm, I'm presuming that that Jerry Weinsdorf will have read my column on, on the Southside Sox from yesterday, suggesting that you won't sell the team for tax reasons and he should just give it away. I, and I did think he should give it to the United Way of, of Metro Chicago because he's screwed and over I thought that, the people I think of Chicago. That's a great well. plan. I think it's yeah, a I great got total plan. support on it. Uh, but he he hasn't done anything yet, but we'll see. So Tony was supposed to be at the Mayo Clinic on Thursday. There's no word from the Sox as of noon on Friday about anything. I presume there would have been doctors reviewing whatever the charts were, whatever the the information was that they had deciding whether they're going to operate, you know, maybe, maybe, I mean, this, anything is total speculation, but, you know, a possibility is, oh, we discovered you've got 75% blockage of a major artery. We got to clean that baby out. Okay. So you're going to have to, there's something that they're going to do. Maybe they're just going to say, oh, I need to rest for a few days and, and some Medicaid. We have no idea. Yes. They don't always little medical facts about Tony La Russa, but they do owe us a, what do we think is going to happen with the team at this point? Now, we all know the team's much better off with Miguel Cairo there. And, you know, one th well, you can get into, I, I covered yesterday's game, so I was paying very close attention to it. One thing that was just, I loved, Cairo bought in Kendall Graveman in the seventh inning. Graveman is usually saved for the eighth inning because that's our procedure. He goes in the eighth and then Hendricks in the ninth if it's a safe situation. And this is not just a, a La Russa thing or a thing. This is stupid major league managing around the horn. But it was the top of the order in the seventh and Cairo mixed it up and brought in his best available reliever for that time for the seventh inning. Boom, boom, boom. boom. Two strikeouts and an easy fly ball. It's over. Uh, I like that. I I really like that. And that well, he did that in his I, third I'm, game. Yeah. And I, I mean, technically, uh, in my opinion, Cairo is actually 2 0 because Larusa did all pregame for Tuesday. I mean, he, he, he called out with an hour to go, and everyone on the team saying he seemed totally fine. So I'm not even going to credit Miguel Cairo with that loss on Tuesday. Well, then he's then he's four and zero lifetime because he had four and zero last lifetime, year, but two and zero this year. And I, I can't credit him. He didn't make the lineup even for Tuesday. So I'm not I'm not blaming Miguel Cairo for that loss. Um, it is so so strange, especially with the players saying he seemed totally fine. He seemed just like himself. He he was ready to go. We were getting ready for the game, and now all of a sudden he's he's out and has to fly. I again, as you said, it's speculation. I will be truly surprised if Tony Larusa has an actual serious medical issue that required him to go home with an hour to go before the game. There was clearly no medical emergency at the time or the team would have said yeah they came and took him out in a stretcher we're worried about the guy no I mean, all they said said was he's going to be looked at on wednesday so we're not talking heart attack or stroke or anything along those lines exactly and so you've got a team saying he seemed fine we think he's fine you got a team that's honestly not even saying stuff like man we really just hope he's okay like they're they're not talking like that they're talking like Man, that's weird. He he, he left. Well, they are all, they are all wishing him well and, and that wishing him thing. wishing him well though. But what they're not saying is, yeah, I could tell something was really off, man. Something this past week has been it, it's been weird. It's been lethargic. It's not been good. They're all like, man, I, I I wish him well. I want him to get better, but 
he, he seemed totally fine to us. I think 100% this is the game plan that he and Reinsdorf came up with. And, and I don't know if he was doing something before the game on Tuesday he's been told not to do, and that's what set this into motion. Uh, or if, if this was just the grand plan to get him out of next year's contract. I think what we're going to find out, if I were to guess, we're going to find out in a few days that he is stepping down for health reasons, but will remain uh, in the front office of the team next year. I, yeah, I think I think they'll give him a job, and and he's really really bad at front office jobs, but they'll hide him the best they can. Yeah, I think it'll be a a fake front office job, but I I do think that's what we're going to see. Um, in terms of, well, we got to take a break, and then we'll come back and talk about Cairo's manager and and what we've and got actual baseball moving forward, and then some actual <laughs> baseball. But obviously, we needed to discuss this. This was the big news of the week for the White Sox, a team that tends to not make any big news. So, uh, yeah, we will be right back after this short break here on Sharing Sox. Welcome back to Sharing Sox. We've given our two cents on TLR. Uh, so let's talk a, a little bit of baseball. We took two out of three from Kansas City, lost the season series to Kansas City, which right then and there should eliminate us from the playoffs. But because we are in the worst division in recent memory, uh, we are still technically in this thing. We have a new coach moving forward for who knows how long. Uh, someone who I think is a significantly better coach. Uh, Miguel Cairo has been was one of my favorite players back when he was playing for Tampa and then for the Reds. Yeah, we both we both like him. Uh, we've been Miguel Cairo fans really from from he his always, day always one. A very, always a very smart player. I have no idea what he did as a bench coach under La Russa because I don't think anybody was ever allowed to do anything except maybe a little Ethan Katz here and there. Uh, interesting. I, uh, yesterday was a YouTube game. Yeah. So I'm covering this whole thing. I, our TV kept freezing up, so I'm covering it on, on computer and watching Scott Braun and Yonder Alonso do the announcing. Braun's okay as, as a play-by-play guy. Alonso, I don't know what he got right ever. But Alonso, and at that point, the Sox on all three of the big predictors, the, the computerized predictors, Pangraphs and Dakota and 538, had about a 5% chance of winning the division, maybe 10% chance of um, getting into the playoffs at all, add, adding in the wild card option. Alonzo said he's given up 50%. <laughs> so, <laughs> the, the, under the under Alonzo uh, system, they're 50%. Now, the fact that the Sox won two games in a row that they were supposed to win, so that doesn't count too much. But Cleveland lost two games in a row to Baltimore. I looked today, and all of those places are saying 10% chance to win the division. Not 50%, but 10%. And much of that depends on what happens this weekend. Minnesota in town without Byron Buxton. Uh, they are not scoring many runs. Needless to say, Correa is not hitting well lately. So that's about their offense, other than the you know, occasional stray hit here and there. Their pitching, which is supposed to be horrible, has been pretty good, strangely. Of course, they made those pickups at, at the deadline. That at first didn't pay off. They were they weren't pitching well, or they got hurt. But apparently, are coming through now. Yeah, I, you know, this is obviously a, a crucial, crucial series. You know, I, I, I can't say the whole season depends on this series, but if you sweep Minnesota, you've really got a shot. You really do because if you're you then tied Minnesota, with Minnesota. Yeah, if you sweep Minnesota, then you've got the momentum. You're kind of knocking them out at that point. And then you you turn it into a, a race to catch Cleveland. Now, the White Sox players continue their, you know, getting injured anytime they breathe uh, thing. So I'm not sure who's <laughs> going to be playing. Aloy, Aloy on Thursday is dh strikes out, lines out, does it one routine ground ball to shortstop that did not require any super extra exertion. Next thing you know, his next time up, Josh Harrison is pinch hitting for him because he's got a bad leg and his right leg, lower right lower leg is all wrapped up. 
what the hell? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the training situation at the White Sox is an absolute joke. If I were a, a trainer on that team, if I were the conditioning guy, I would just be embarrassed. I would know that I'm losing my job. But at some point, the players need to take this upon themselves to prepare themselves physically for these games. I mean, you're getting paid millions of dollars. Your next batch of millions of dollars depends on your ability to stay on the field. And our players seem to not have that ability outside of our oldest guy. Uh, I don't, I'm truly at a loss for these injuries at this point. Every team faces injuries, constant injuries. It happens. But they tend to get hurt doing things. And our it's, guys tend to get hurt not doing things. So there, there are some, like, like the, Luis Robert, who goodness knows gets injured, just kind of routinely running to first. His latest one with the wrist, I mean, that was just a jam shot sliding into second. It happens. That's sure. just bad luck. That, that has nothing to do with training. It's bad luck. Uh, but all of these, you know, the hammies and the, the, the vague leg, how the hell can Andrew Vaughn have leg problems? He barely moves. Barely uh, moves. Barely moves. I mean, he, there's few people in professional sports who run at a less impressive level than Andrew Vaughn. I mean, if, if running is going to hurt your leg, Andrew Vaughn, just walk. Just walk. Because your, your full sprint speed is just above a traditional walk pace anyway. So just walk. I, I mean, I, I truly don't understand all these, these vague, vague, you phrase it perfectly, these vague leg, leg injuries. I, I, I almost said vague leg, which would be the, <laughs> the Wisconsin way of saying it, but we're the White Sox, not the Brewers. Uh, uh, I'm, I, I don't know. I, I'm clearly, I'm at the point in the season where every time I watch a game, someone gets hurt seemingly doing nothing. And I, I just don't know anymore. I don't know how you fix it. I don't know how you stop it. I We've gone to games. We've watched them warm up. They warm up worse than little leaguers. I mean, you, you see little league teams out there stretching in a circle, getting better prepared than the White Sox do for each professional baseball game they're about to play. I don't know how there hasn't been a coach. If I were Miguel Cairo, before this game today, I would say you're all stretching together out on the field like little leaguers. You have to. You're stretching in a circle. We're going to have a guy lead stretching each day, and this is what it's going to be. And honestly, that would be really good for this team. It would be really good to have to stretch in front of each other, to have to build camaraderie in a stupid stretching circle. It works for little league teams. So why not bring it up to the major league level? Because what we are seeing is just – pathetic it's pathetic and uh, and i feel like it it's part of the school of la Russa. you know save your legs so don't stretch them because if you stretch them you might burn them out uh but we are not in the school of la Russa right now we need to make some changes in the school of cairo and and it has to start with conditioning training doing a much better job with game preparation clearly our pitchers seem to be doing a decent job in terms of, of stretching and doing what they need to do to stay healthy for the most part. Some guys are gassed at this point. I mean, but we, we, have, we have pitching injuries, but they're probably less than average. Yeah, I, and, I think, and pitching we're, injuries, we're are, pitching injuries are common. Inevitable. Yeah, yeah pitching well. injuries are going to happen. But clearly Katz has them on a program that somewhat keeps them in, in the game. Our position players... It's a joke. It's a joke. I mean, I'm 35. I turn 36 next week. I play softball. I stretch a lot before a softball game. Why are our players not preparing to play Major League Baseball? These guys are 24, 25, 26, and they're consistently injured trotting to first base. I, I, I mean – somebody's at fault here and and whether it's the conditioning coaches or the players we could argue about all day but somebody's at fault here we need to see some changes i would love to see miguel cairo forcing everyone into a little league stretching circle before the game uh, whatever we got to do to humble these guys who are too cool for school 
we need to humble them and we need to humble them fast if we have any chance of winning this thing. Uh, we also desperately need Tim Anderson back. And Hello, you know, Elvis, Elvis interest is doing a good job. I just mean in terms, he's, he's of, better than in terms of spirit. In terms of spirit, we need Tim Anderson back. We need Tim yeah. Anderson back while La Russa is gone. Which <laughs> won't happen, but that's what we need because that is our winning combo is getting Tim Anderson back and not having La Russa in there to bring down the morale on this team to pits of despair that only, you know, Tolkien could dream of. Uh, I, I have another thing on winning combo, just because I looked it up, I want to squeeze it in. You know, there's a lot, Well, they don't hit home runs. They don't hit enough home runs. They're hitting opposite field too much, you know, too much on the ground, blah, 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 blah. And it's true. Uh, home runs are way down. Of course, home runs are way down around the league, but they're still in about 25th or so. But I, I looked up, the problem to me is not that if you play small ball or semi-small ball, it's if you do it badly. And the problem is they do it badly. So productive outs, an important part. If you're not hitting homers, productive outs are very important. 23rd in the majors. Uh, the real and for, for for listeners, productive outs are moving a moving a runner along. You got a guy in second, nobody outs you. Make sure you hit to the right side so he gets to third. Uh, man on third, fewer than two outs. 29th. Only the Marlins are lower. Oh now, my at, god. They're almost average on no outs and a man on second. So I guess that's good for extra innings. Uh 17th. So right, right around the middle. Grounding into double plays, tenth most times of anybody. Uh I'm actually surprised we're tenth on that. I would have thought we were higher up. I would have thought we were worse. You know where we were abs- we're absolutely dead last for a team that's if you're not gonna hit homers, you get you gotta do good things on the bases, right? Sack flies. Dead last in triples. Oh, well. Dead last in the majors and triples. 26th in stolen bases. Stolen base percentage is really good. But that's because you almost never steal. And only three right. guys only three guys do it. And at any given time, two of the three are hurt. And the other yeah. one is not allowed to play. So it's, Stolen base percentage when you don't actually rack up stolen bases is irrelevant. I mean, it's... Yeah. Okay. I, yeah, I'm not even going to go into that. It's, it's, ri- it's ridiculous to be 26th in stolen bases, but when you have like three of the five slowest guys in all of baseball playing uh, frequently. Yeah. And the, the problem is if you've got home runs while you've got station to station people in at least five spots in the line, but you're always going to have a catcher like that. You're always going to have a first baseman like that. But we've also at any given time got left and right fielders like that and DH like that. So out of nine guys, at any moment, five are really slow. A couple may be fast, depending on who's in the lineup, and a, and a couple average, where they can go from first to third, but they're not going to steal the base kind of thing. And who are your guys on the White Sox who even can hit a triple? Luis Robert, hurt most of the time, doesn't hustle. Adam Engel does hustle, but is hurt most of the time. And isn't uh, allowed Tim, to play the rest. Tim Anderson, who's not playing. Um Laori, <laughs> LOL. Speaking and, of, incidentally, I, I I put in a jab about Miguel Cairo starting Laori on Thursday. Laori <laughs> gets two hits, uh, makes a nice catch. <laughs> and, but that's what uh, Laori does. Around. That's what Laori does. We we teases. He, he starts so many games and sucks so much, and then we say something about it, and then he goes out in the next game and plays a great game of baseball. So we just got a rag on Lurie every single time at a vicious level. And and clearly it's getting to him and, and it'll amp him up. Um, so we've got Minnesota for three coming up. Uh, we are the at, Mariners. We are at home. Then we play the Mariners, who are as hot as hot can be, I think, right now. And playing Cleveland first. They are right. in Cleveland, and then they go home to host us. Uh, now, this last week, we said, well, we got to go five and one, Arizona and Kansas City, and then we lost the first four in a row. Looked like we might make one and five there for a while. Uh, I I don't think a sweep of Minnesota, particularly we've got Davis Martin pitching. 
uh, Friday night. And uh, Lucas with all those problems on Sunday. I think a sweep is very unlikely, but you got to take two out of three. You have to take Absolutely two out of three. Absolutely, you have to take two out of three. I mean, and I think you... You, you, you need to take two out of three. They need to split this week. At the very least, split this week, but preferably go four and two. I mean, if you split this week, what are we aiming for here? Uh, yeah, you're running out of time. Yeah. Yeah, there's there's no time. It is September 2nd. We We need to start sweeping, guys. We need to start putting together runs like we see the Braves do in the second half of the season, both, you know, last year and this year, like we're seeing the Mariners do as they're picking up steam for the second year in a row in the second half. We, we can't be doing, we can't be playing for, for two out of three anymore for two out of four for three out of four. We have to be playing with sweep intensity or it's done. I mean, I can't believe we're even, talking about making the playoffs at this point with the or what are we are we one game under 500 right now yes one game under yeah. 65 66 i think we're one game under 500 on september 2nd and here we are talking about playoffs it's a joke it's a joke of a division yeah in, the, in, re, in reality start... nobody from the al central should be allowed to make the playoffs nobody <laughs> nobody and the entire it should be the entire al east and whoever wins the west <laughs> yeah Maybe not Boston, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, put the Mariners in instead of Boston. Absolutely, absolutely. Because, um, you know, at this point, yeah, okay, winning two out of three is good. Going three and three over the next six, fine. But how does that in any way shape us up to win even a playoff game? We, I, I'm not seeing a world where if we do make the playoffs, we win a game in the playoffs. Yeah, we would throw Cease theoretically for that game if we don't have to throw him in game 162 to make it. Uh, it is just such a – our dreams are so low at this <laughs> point. We are not reaching for the stars. We're reaching for whatever the lowest level of atmosphere is before you even get to space. Uh, it is – it's so bleak and and you know we talk about my my socks guys on our our text thread how unfun the wins are to watch uh that's a, that's a sad thing and i, I agree i mean I'm, I'm i'm watching a game i mean yesterday's was pathetic again they're gonna win it's kansas city they built up a lead their relievers struck out 12 White Sox. There was there was a period. I'll forget the numbers. I had it in the in the post game, but there was a period there between the two teams, something like 16 out of 18 guys struck out. Terrible. I mean, what the And heck? that's a team that we lost the season series to. That is a team that we should if we played 19 games against them. We should have won 14. And we won nine. And we won nine. I mean, not beating Kansas City. We rallied to win that. <laughs> yeah, and they were a very unimpressive nine, with the exception of maybe one of them. So uh, if we come out of this next week, frankly, I don't even want us to beat Seattle because I want Seattle to make a miracle comeback and overtake Houston in the West. But I will root for the White Sox against Seattle still next week. We got to take – we got to, I think – Personally, we got to sweep Minnesota. We got to take two out of three against Seattle. If we want to not only put ourselves in a place to win this division, but get some sort of momentum as a good baseball team heading into the second half of September. Because right now, winning three out of six, what do you do? You, you, you maybe squeak, squeak by, get into the playoffs, and then you just lose right away. I mean, there, there's no momentum in that, you know, it's, you're getting in by technicality, which is that somebody has to go from the central. Um, but we are about running out of time here. Do you have any final thoughts as we head into this big week? Uh, no, <laughs> no, no. I will say, even though we are haters, sending Tony LaRusa uh, the best well wishes we can hope he's okay. Hope his doctors say, you know what, you'll survive as long as you stay home and don't coach another Major League Baseball game ever again. 
That's the dream scenario. Uh, but in the meantime, sending all the good vibes to Miguel Cairo. Man, how freaking sweet would it be if we win these next six games? How <laughs> freaking pretty cool. sweet. It would be the ultimate fan service to win these next six games with Tony out. That would just be the dream. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's a dream. So uh, we will see you next time, uh, hopefully, with some great news. I feel like every time I sign off saying, hopefully, we'll come back next week with some great news, we lose four out of six or five out of six. Uh, but here we are. We're, we're in striking distance of the playoffs. So let's get it done. Go White Sox. Thanks for listening. And we will see you next week on Sharing Socks.